Thank you for that introduction. Um, and I, before I get started, I got to thank Dr. Burton for the opportunity to present today um, in this great event. And also all of you for sticking it out on a Friday evening with us and our friends and family who are all here today uh, to listen to me talk a little bit about minimally invasive spine surgery. Uh, as I was listening to some of the talks leading up to this, I realized I have a pretty cool job. Um, I get to take some of the problem solving things that Natalie talked about in her first uh, speech and use that every day to solve patients' problems. Uh, Joseph spoke about the importance of debating and intelligent conversation, as well as Kai talking about walls and breaking down boundaries. And Mark just talked about thinking outside the box to uh, always be on your best every day. And, um, oh, and I can't forget Chris, who talked about uh, taking a task and doing it better. And if I could summarize minimally invasive spine surgery, that's exactly what it is. It's taking a task and trying to do it better, the task of spine surgery. Now, we're on a college campus, and I thought, throughout the years, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of people uh, and had a lot of people influence uh, my training, so on and so forth. Uh, and you don't start out as a spine surgeon. Uh, so I started out in a small college in Philadelphia, and I started out in physical therapy school. I worked with a physical therapist named Bobby DeLulo. Um, Bobby taught me that, uh, <clears throat> spine sur that uh, taking care of patients is probably one of the greatest gifts to be able to help people with their problems on a uh, daily basis. <clears throat> and uh, along the way, that's what I've been fortunate to be able to do. We get to help patients um, solve their problems. We get to help them feel better. And we've been challenged with the task to find better ways to do that along the way. So anatomy, though, hasn't changed. Anatomy has stayed pretty constant. New books come out, but it's still the same anatomy inside the books. One of the things that we learned as a physical therapist was the importance of core strengthening and flexibility for your spine to help maintain a strong spine. And probably many of you know that, the concept of yoga or Pilates or uh, core strengthening to help try to avoid surgery. So then I go forward and uh, go from being a physical therapist to a surgeon. And now I'm told, well, if that doesn't work, We'll do the exact opposite. And we'll take those muscles that you took all that time strengthening, and uh, we'll take that flexibility, and we'll just kind of cut through those muscles and uh, destroy them, and we'll fuse the spine in the process. So there was definitely a conflict there in the whole process of spine care that I had a lot of difficulty trying to resolve in my own mind. And I realized as time goes on, <clears throat> people don't evolve as fast as our techniques do. So while the anatomy stays constant, it's our techniques and our surgical skills that evolve. And over time, all surgical techniques need to evolve to become less invasive. <clears throat> so we use this term, minimally invasive spine surgery, which I don't really like. If you look at the definition of minimal, it says barely adequate. And I don't think anybody would like to entertain the idea of having barely adequate surgery or seeing a barely adequate specialist. So uh, that's one of the problems. And the other thing is that if you've heard this phrase, minimally invasive surgery, don't think that just because it's done through a small incision, it's not a real operation and that problems can't happen. <clears throat> this would be an example. This is a patient that was referred to me from a very good surgeon who wanted to uh, foray into the realm of minimally invasive surgery. Now, <clears throat> the screws on the left uh, should look more like the screws on the right. They don't uh, belong exactly where they are. In fact, 
I'm not sure if any of them actually hit the mark. So the person did very well, uh, but minimally invasive surgery not done well can still be problematic. So a lot of people hear about minimally invasive surgery and they think lasers, robots, or stem cells should be involved. And uh, if I were to start maybe a, an entrepreneurial practice, I might call it the Malloy Institute for Robotic Laser Assisted Stem Cell Surgery because <laughs> everybody would be interested, you know? Um, while these are tools that we do use. Robots today do not do the operation for you. Uh, lasers cannot do the surgery. They are precise for cutting tissue uh, and are used, but they don't perform the operation. And uh, stem cells cannot clone you a new spine. Uh, but these tools are important in minimally invasive surgery. But as you learn to use these tools, you have to realize that not everything can be fixed with just one tool. Um, there was a movie uh, called Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and Jeff Spicoli said, my dad's a TV repairman. He has the ultimate set of tools. He could fix it. We have to be more like TV repairmen. We can't walk around with a hammer looking at everything like a nail and thinking we can solve it with just one operation that fits most people. So as we evolve, we get to use cooler equipment. This is uh, an example of robotic assisted CT guided imaging that allows us to gain access to places that would be difficult to see uh, without um, direct visualization by opening the person up. And so this would be a case example. And I apologize that I don't have any pictures of alligator bitten hands or firecracker exploded hands for the kids. Uh, but some of these pictures that are still in here uh, are a little graphic. So if uh, the surgical pictures bother anyone, I do apologize in advance. Uh, this was college age student. He uh, was starting at FSU, I believe, and um, was a freshman. He had this fracture, uh, if you can see oh, down there on the PET scan, right there. There's, um, this lights up in the area of a fracture. Uh, so this fracture we typically treat in a brace. Uh, the brace would theoretically give the fracture a chance to heal, just like putting a cast on someone's arm. Um, however, we know the data on these fractures, and they don't heal. Over time, they become less symptomatic, but the bone never actually heals. And again, that's another conflict or conundrum in orthopedics where who accepts a broken arm that still flaps around? That's not usually an acceptable outcome. But the concept was that to operate on a fracture like this, the morbidity associated with the surgery would be greater than um, letting it go on to a non-union or a fibrous union. So after his entire freshman year in a back brace, which it's been a while since I went to college, but when I was a freshman, I don't remember chicks digging guys in back braces. <laughs> so his freshman year did not go so well, and I started to think, you know, the socio sociologic impact of wearing a back brace may outweigh the risks of minimally invasive surgery. So the pictures on the right are actually the uh, microscopic view, that's an instrument going into the fracture site called a curette. Uh, we're taking down the fracture that's not healed, uh, bone grafting it, and then using CT guided imaging through a poke hole incision, I was able to place that screw directly across the fracture. Um, I think he spent the night in the hospital, went home the next day, the fracture healed. He joined a fraternity, plays intramural sports. I have no idea who his girlfriend is. But <clears throat> so the idea is that we are evolving as surgeons to develop techniques that allow us to do real operations 
just in a less destructive way so that we don't destroy your muscles and we don't necessarily take away all the normal function of your spine. We preserve the normal anatomy and correct just the pathology and that should lead for uh, a quicker recovery and less morbid procedures. So why do it? Um, is it because there's a smaller incision? Well, all right, maybe. Is it because it's less painful? Well, it is for the patient, but not always for the surgeon. When you're in training and you're trying to learn to do these things without being able to see them, uh, it can be a little bit painful to learn. Uh, lower risk of infection? Absolutely. The risk of infection with open spine surgery is 4.5%. With uh, minimally invasive spine surgery, it's less than 1%. Blood loss? People rarely ever need a transfusion from less invasive surgery. Shorter hospital stay is there. Uh, people want it. People want to get better faster. If I was told that I needed to take six months to a year off to have an operation and um, then I could go back to my job, I would say, not happening. I, don't, I, can't, I can't do that. Uh, people need to get back to work, back to life faster. So <clears throat> will the long-term results be the same? It's to be determined, I guess, because these are newer techniques. However, they're still the same operations. So there's really no reason to think that they won't have the same outcomes. So then I look back to my training, and my training I considered to be MIS, maximally invasive surgery. Sorry if any of you guys are watching. Uh, so during my training, we did big open procedures. And now we rarely have to do sur surgeries open in that style. I look back at some other things that were popular during that time. There was a show called about a family in uh, California, a reality show. And then I looked at, well, how much has changed since 2007 through 2019? <laughs> Most of the anatomy stays fairly constant. So the techniques is what's allowed us to evolve. But this is confusing to patients because, boy, I see in the range of 40 to 50 patients a day, a couple days a week when I'm not in surgery, that's a few thousand patients a uh, year. And you have to be able to communicate with them quickly, listen to them, hear what their problem is, solve their problem, all within a few minutes. Um, so that takes in a lot of the skills that we talked about today. Uh, but for patients, it's confusing. And they hear about these different procedures that all have acronyms for them. ACDF, TDR, ALIF, OLIF, XLIF, DLIF, TLIF, PLIF, whatever. So they go on and on. And um, the biggest thing, I guess, uh, to understand about these procedures is that they're all different ways for us as surgeons to access your spine in a less invasive manner uh, for the most part. This is just a diagram to help any of you who are curious and what they mean, showing the different approaches that one could use to uh, access the spine through the various different uh, alphabet soup letters. So again, uh, maximally invasive surgery was done this way. This is a traditional open scoliosis correction. <clears throat> this is a case I did uh, during fellowship. Uh, today, I would do this case like this. So this is now done percutaneously using image guidance through all those little tubes to place all of those screws. So we'll zoom in. And we can achieve correction like this. We take a person with a large deformity and bend their spine straight in a much less morbid way. I don't think it's okay for somebody to come into the hospital for an elective procedure and looking like they got attacked by a shark. So the idea of these smaller incisions 
is important. What we've done, though, along the way is we've taken our traditional, what I like to refer to as a shark bite incision over the person's spine, and we just use the small portion of it that we need to access the area we need to. So now the incision might look like this, um, just enough to make room for us to pass a retractor that's um, table mounted or uh, has a light source in it so we can see inside. And then using long handled instruments, we can work down a tube into the person's spine, uh, correcting their pathology while preserving everything that's normal around it. I love this slide because the anesthesiologist is even paying attention. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> This is a patient with a burst fracture, a pathologic burst fracture. This would be a uh, tumor to the spine that caused the bone to weaken and collapse. Typically, this would require a large shark bite style incision to remove the tumor and the fractured vertebrae, decompress the spine, and uh, restore the normal alignment. This was done through that tubular retractor that I showed there. <clears throat> Even less invasive, if you don't have to remove the whole vertebrae, you just need to lift it back up the way it belongs through two poke hole incisions. A balloon could be placed, the end plate of the vertebrae could be lifted up, and then instead of removing the whole vertebrae, you could fill it with some bone cement, polymethyl methacrylate will add some support and stability to it and alleviate people's pain. So if I were to summarize the benefits of minimally invasive surgery for people, I would say uh, it, it's the evolution of uh, what we've done all along, just getting better with time. It has known benefits, um, but don't think of it as not uh, real surgery. Thank you.